Number sheet number two, questions seven and eight that we had for homework last night. I want to do both of these questions. They both look real similar. The data is almost the same for both of them, but there is an important difference between the two of them. We'll see what that is in just a moment. Question number seven says a rock, a 1.5 kilogram rock falls from rest from the top of a 10 meter high building and strikes the ground below. Calculate the impulse uh, experienced by the rock during its fall. Question eight says, same rock falls from the same building, strikes the ground below again. What's the force of the ground acting on the rock if it comes to a stop in 0 0.350 seconds? Besides the fact that in one question, we're asking for impulse, and the other question, we're asking for force, which is clearly a difference, what is fundamentally the difference between these two questions? We're asked for impulse in one, force in the other, but there's something else that makes this different. Yep. Yes, the force is acting in the opposite direction as the impulse. And why? Because isn't impulse and force supposed to be in the same direction? Impulse is F times T. So if the force is to the right, then the impulse should be to the right. But in this case, question number seven has an impulse that's downward. Question number eight has a force that's positive. It's upward. So why? Why is one of them negative and one of them positive? Pay really close attention to the question. Question number seven says, um, the impulse experienced by the rock during its fall. Question number eight is the force of impact during the impact. That's two different questions, isn't it? Forget about what we're looking to find. It's two different situations. We're analyzing the trip down by the rock. And then we're analyzing the collision of the rock with the ground. It's two completely different questions, right? The fall and then the collision with the ground. Now, there is a number that we can carry forward from question seven to question eight, but we have to be careful with it if we do carry it forward here. Let's do question number seven now. It says a 1.5 kilogram rock. All right, let's write that down as our first given. Uh, falls from rest on the top of a 10 meter high building. What's this 10 meters going to be for us? What is it? Negative, did somebody say? Yeah, we'll make it negative. What do you want to make it, though? The I, the F, displacement, yeah. The displacement is negative 10 meters, good. Um, what's the impulse? We're looking for delta P. Not the impulse during the collision with the ground, but rather the impulse of the fall from that height to the ground. What else do we have? There is something else if we read between the lines here. Yeah, Emily? Yes, we know that acceleration is negative 9.81 meters per second squared. Uh, there is one more thing that we have as well. VI. Yes, VI is what? Good. VI is zero meters per second. Now, some of you might look at this and say, to find impulse, I'm going to use F times delta T. Is that a valid equation? Absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. You want to find impulse, you're allowed to use F times delta T. Now, that may or may not be helpful to you, there's going to be times when you have a valid equation that aren't helpful, right? If I want to find the acceleration of something, and I'm given uh, the displacement and the time and VI, A is equal to delta V over delta T isn't going to get me the answer, but it's still a valid equation. This is a valid equation. Maybe it doesn't get me the answer, but I can absolutely try it at least. Worst case scenario is it doesn't get me an answer, and I have to try another one. What's the other valid equation, by the way, here besides F times T? Yeah. On your data sheet, you know that it says F times delta T is equal to M times delta V. And I told you, you should probably write in this beside it. That means that impulse is equal to both F times T and it's equal to M times delta V. Either one is valid here. And in fact, either one can work. You can make either one work. How many people do this one? How many people use this, F times T? Nobody. This one? Okay. That's what I expected most people to use it, but I thought maybe there might be a few people to try this one. Let's do it the way that everybody did it, and then I'll show you the other way, all right? Impulse is equal to M times delta V. M is 1.50 kilograms. What's delta V? Well, it's VF minus VI, right? But VI is what? Zero. Zero, right? So all we got to do is find VF here, and that gives me delta V. How are we going to find delta V? Or VF, I should say, yeah? VF squared is equal yeah, it's the one that we almost always seem to use here, right? 
It doesn't have to be this one, but it just always seems to be this one. So let's say now VF is equal to the square, this is zero, right? Square root of 2 times neg 9.81 times uh, neg 10 gives me a VF of 14.00714 meters per second. That's my final speed, right? What's my final velocity? Negative 14. So if that's my final speed, let's make this my final velocity. And then let's sub that into here. And then let's multiply those two together and get negative 21.0 newton seconds. Or we could have said kilograms meters per second. That makes sense that it's a negative value. As this rock falls, what happens to its momentum? Does it increase or decrease? The momentum increases. It's increasing in the negative. negative direction. Remember we said we get a negative impulse when you increase momentum in the negative direction, right? Now, anybody wa wants to see it the other way? Let me just show you quickly how you would go about doing this. If we said delta P is equal to F times T, say, well, uh, look, what's, what's F? Uh, I don't know. What's T? Uh, I don't know. We could find F, though, pretty easily, right? What force is acting on this rock as it accelerates downward? Gravity. Uh, I don't know what the time is either. We could find that, right? Couldn't you find that? Like doing something like d is equal to vit plus one half a t squared. This is zero. You know what this is. You know what this. You could find t there, right? Mm -hmm. And then you could sub it into here, multiply it by m and g, and guess what you get? Negative 21.0 newton seconds. Like it has to be, right? Like if you're doing something right, it has to give you the same answer as somebody else that does something right, even if it looks different. Good? Um, listen, I agree. Uh, probably this is the way to go. That's the way I did it as well. The first time that I did this question. Just know that there are sometimes other ways of doing it too. Okay, question number eight. This time we're looking at the force of the ground acting on the rock. What's VI? No. No, it's not. What's VI, Calvin? Yes. VI is negative 14.00714 meters per second. Let's think about that, right? We're analyzing the collision with the ground. How fast is it moving when it hits the ground? 14. How fast is it moving after it hits the ground? Zero. The VF is zero here, right? Right, the time interval here is, what, 0 0.350 seconds? Oh, wait a second. Don't we already know the impulse? What is it? Oh, uh, somebody said 21, and somebody said negative 21. Which one is it? 21 or negative 21? Who says, who says 21? Who says negative 21? The winners are positive 21. How's it? What, wait, is, we just found it to be negative 21. Yeah, the impulse of the fall is negative 21 because we gained 21 momentum on the trip down, right? But what happened when it collided with the ground? It didn't gain 21 units of momentum. It, it lost it, right? When it hits the ground, it lost that momentum. So now, when we're colliding with the ground, we've lost momentum in the negative direction. Gain momentum in the negative direction, that's a negative impulse. Lose momentum in the negative direction, that's a positive impulse. So my impulse here would be positive 21.0. Same number, right? If I gain 21 on the trip down, then I have to lose 21 during the collision. But gaining 21 is negative, losing 21 is positive. Um, you know what I'm going to do here since I already found since I already found delta P here I'm just going to say delta P is equal to F times T take the T over by dividing and I get delta P over T it's 21.0 divided by 0 0.350 now you could have said F times T is equal to M times delta V can I rework to that but if you recognize that the impulse has got to be equal and opposite then 
should be good. F works out to be positive 60 newtons here. How come that's a positive force? Look at what I did first in my answer key here. See what I did? I had negative, right? And I scratched it out. Because I recognized that, wait a second, I got a negative answer, but in my head I'm like, it shouldn't be negative. Why shouldn't it be negative? Why should it be positive? A rock falls, which way does the force have to act to stop it? Upwards, right? It's not a coincidence that it worked out to be a positive value. Okay, I kind of fudged it on my answer key because I recognized it should come out to be positive. But when I thought about it, it's like, well, the math makes it positive. The reason I got negative is because I did what some of you did and made that negative 21. It just shouldn't be, that's all. It was a mistake to make that negative 21. Listen, guys, um, that's important. But the most important part of this question is getting the 60. A lot of times when they ask us one like this, they ask us for the magnitude of the force. And if they ask us just for the magnitude, then all of you would have gotten it right, whether you said positive or negative. Okay, we want to be able to nail it, get the right sign just in case, but usually you're okay on this question even if you don't get the, same, the right sign. All right? I want to do another example here, but I got to tell you something about this example first. I'm going to take us back to physics 20. Remember Newton's first law in physics 20? Object at rest, stays at rest. Object in motion, stays in motion. Newton's second law, we just talked about it yesterday, right, when we derived the impulse equation. F is equal to m times a. Newton's third law, if object A applies a force on object B, object B will apply an equal and opposite force on object A. Always? Always? Every single time? Yes. Sometimes we don't believe Newton when he said every single time there's an equal and opposite force. You guys had a question on your physics 20 final, or um, unit test, dynamics unit test. No matter whose class you were in, mine or Mr. Cordero's, you both saw the same question. It said something to the effect of a bug splatters against a windshield of a truck. Remember that? How do the forces compare? What was the answer? They were equal and opposite. How could they be equal and opposite? The bug hit a truck. The bug splattered. The truck just kept going. How could those forces be equal and opposite? Yeah, listen, it's always the same force. It's just the effect of the force isn't always the same. The force that the bug applied on the windshield was the same as the windshield applied on a bug. That wasn't enough force to break the windshield. That was enough force to break the bug. It's the same force. The bug is weaker than the windshield. That's it. The forces are always equal and opposite. Always equal and opposite. If, during a collision, the forces are always equal and opposite, and the time of contact between the bug and the windshield is the same as the time of contact between the windshield and the bug, and it must be, right? If the bug is in contact with the windshield for 0.2 seconds, then the windshield must be in contact with the bug for 0.2 seconds. So if the force is equal and opposite, and the time is the same, then what do we know about the impulse? It's the same, or opposite, right? Equal and opposite. When you have two objects colliding with each other, not only will the forces be equal and opposite, but the impulse will be equal and opposite as well. In other words, the momentum gained by one is equal to the momentum lost by the other one. One guy has a moment, an impulse of plus 10. The other one has an impulse of negative 10. Plus 10 and negative 10, or plus 37 and negative 37. The momentum has always got to be equal and opposite. And it doesn't matter what the mass or the velocity of the objects were. The mass of the truck was way more than the mass of the bug. Its velocity probably was too. But the forces were the same, and the impulse was the same. Now, you're going to see this in the next problem that we do, the example that we do. But it's important to note here that 
you can use impulse still to solve a problem, even when there are two objects, right? All the, all the problems that we've done thus far with impulse have involved one object. You can do it with two objects, but if you do that, just make sure that you pick an object. Analyze either object one or object number two. Don't mix and match the data, though. If you're using VI for object number one, great. Use VF for object number one. If you're using VI for object number two, great. But use VF for object number two. Just make sure that you're consistent. You can do it, but pick an object and be consistent through that whole question. Example question number two. Picks up from you. Example question number one on the same sheet yesterday. It says a 1,200-kilogram car traveling north collides with another car traveling south. We've got a north and a south here. I want to draw attention to that because one of them's got to be positive, one of them's got to be negative. The more we draw attention to things that lead to silly mistakes, the less we make silly mistakes. Bless you. The two cars entangle. Do you know what that means? They entangle? It's just like they become one. They stick together, and then they head off as one object afterwards. So it looks like just one massive wreckage heading off together after the collision. At 0 0.901 meters per second to the north, immediately after the collision. The collision lasts for 0 0.08 seconds. What's the force of impact on the lighter car, and what's the force of impact on the heavier car? Uh, let's call uh, the 1,200-kilogram car object number one, and let's call the 1,000-kilogram car object number two. M1 is 1,200 kilograms. Uh, what, is, what do we get here? 10 meters per second? What is that? It's V, yes, it's V. Is it V1 or V2? V1, yes. Is it V1 initial or V1 final? Yes, that's the initial velocity, how fast it's moving before the collision takes place. Um, we got another car here. M2 is 1,000 kilograms, and its initial velocity is, we're going to make it negative 10 meters per second because it's going to the south. Good. What is this point 0.901? What do you want to call that? VF, yeah. You could call it v, V1F, V2F, because it's both of them, right? Or you could just call it VF if you want, since it's both of them. Uh, since I have my givens listed separately here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name it both. V1F is 0 0.901 meters per second, and I'm going to say V2F is 0 0.901 meters per second. My, in, my time interval here is 0 0.0800 seconds. Uh, and it is for this one as well. Because if one of them is in contact for that long, then they both are. We're looking for the force of impact on both of them. Uh, which one do you want to do first? Doesn't matter, right? Doesn't matter. See the blue one first, since that's what I got listed first, OK? Uh, we could, why don't we just do this? Yeah, right? Yeah. We could, we could, if we wanted to, calculate the impulse by using m times delta v, and then setting the impulse equal to f times delta t, right? Or we could just set those equal to each other like we did. What do we get here? 1,200 kilograms times uh, delta V, which is 0 0.901 minus 10 over 0 0.0800 seconds. Let's calculate that now as a group here. 1,200 times, let's use some brackets here, 0 0.901 minus 10. And then let's divide that by 0 0.08. Negative 1.36 times 10 to the 5. Does that negative make sense, sir? Which way was car 1 going? North. What kind of force is required to stop it? Or at least to not stop it, I guess, because 
it, it's not stopping, right? It's going 0 0.901 afterwards. But what force is applied on it when it's when there's a head-on collision? The opposite. the opposite way, right? To the south. We got a force to the south here. That seems reasonable, right? Yeah. What's the green force? Anybody know what that is? Emily? Positive 1.36 times 10 to the 5. Done. I'm actually going to do it mathematically here just to prove that, but you don't have to. Watch this. 0 0.901 minus negative 10. See that? Minus negative 10. Divided by 0 0.08. Let's calculate that one now. 1,000 times bracket 0 0.901 minus negative 10 divided by 0 0.08. And as Emily predicted, we get 1.36 times 10 to the 5. Positive. Wow. It's not a coincidence, right? Every single time it has to work out to be that way. Now, guys, if Emily notices that on the test, that, oh, it's got to be the same force and Let's just, let's just say it's 1.36. That's fine. I'll give you marks for that, right? But if you do it both ways, what's the benefit of doing it both ways here? It's a great check, right? Like if you do it both ways and you get the same answer both ways, like you almost know for sure you're correct, right? The odds of you being wrong now are like slim to none. Like it almost has to be right if you get the same number. Similarly, if you get two different numbers, what do you know? You know for sure you've done it wrong. You've made a mistake somewhere. Go back and check it. If you trust yourself, just go with the 1.36. Or if you want to verify, then do it both ways.